Praise the Lord. You reach Pastor Ella Halling. Let us go to the throne of grace. Heaven, eternity, Father, we love you, we honor you, we worship you, we adore you, we exalt you for being holy and righteous and pure and true. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being a good report, faithful and dependable and just, sovereign and almighty. We thank you for the consecration, the validation, the revelation, the demonstration, and the authorization that we might be made vessels of honor, exemplifying the excellency of the power that resides within. We pray, Father, that you would just yield, have these vessels to yield to the movement of your spirit, that your ways that are higher than our ways will always be adorned and exalted. That imaginations will be cast down and everything that exalts itself over the knowledge and will will be brought into a objection to your obedience. For your thoughts are not even our thoughts and we need you more than ever before. We thank you for the diversification of the administration and the orchestration of your working. We thank you for your love. And we love you that compels for obedience. We thank you, oh Heavenly Father, for your wisdom that compels all wisdom. And we thank you, O Heavenly Father, that no matter what goes on, we can rejoice exceedingly. Because when we obey you, there's a greater blessing. The blessing is assigned to a vessel and the overflow would only be absorbed, manifested, when the blessed vessel is operating in the midst. And so God, I thank you that no one can change your ordained will. Nobody can change your ordained authority because that's what makes you God. And so we can rejoice in all things, giving you thanks because we know you are the ultimate one that upholds all things by the power of your word. And Jesus' name, we exalt you. In Jesus' name, we rest and trust in your provisions. Amen, 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 amen. There's something about trusting in the holy and righteous God. I, you know, I, I just, I'm so grateful for God because he gives you the opportunity. And when God does it, you accept because you love him. And it's his love that first loved you that overflowed in the knowledge of his will because you know his will and knowledge to be more excellent than humanity's knowledge. That's why you can have joy, unspeakable joy. It's not based on any provisions that humanity can manifest or lack of provisions, because God is the ultimate resource of all. And so there's nothing that you can't access according to God's will when he authorizes the access because the veil has been torn down. And it's the tearing down of the veil that gives us the access to the Holy of Holies. Oh, Lord, my God. 
Amen. 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 There's something about trusting in the holy and righteous God that you serve. You serve. Yeah, keep you yeah, in the midst of it all. He'll keep you yeah, in his perfect will and knowledge to overcome obstacles that really have no significance in your life. That's the strength that God gives you. When the wiser one understands that you need the strength of God to endure life trials and tribulations that you need the knowledge of God the will of God to be able to withstand anything that comes against you because the adversary is always lurking to see who he can devour and destroy so the Bible says grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect and weakness. The wiser one understands that these earthly vessels are all weak, except with the excellency of the power of God. So what is sufficient for you is God's grace. The wiser one understands you need the grace of God for his strength to be made perfect in these vessels. And if you would turn with the second Sam six, six through seven is where we're going to have our foundational message from. The Bible says that the Ark of the Covenant that was recorded in Old Testament and second Samuel's and first Chronicles had a very specific instructions about who could touch it. Not everybody could touch the Ark of the Covenant. God is a God of order, purpose, and instructions. And the same as he gave Adam and Eve instructions in the garden not to touch, he also gave the Israelites orders not to touch the Ark. Only certain people who he had given authority to were permitted to handle the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was a sacred chest made according to the instructions given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. God still gives instruction. He gives instructions to his prophets of things that pass. He gives warnings to his prophets of things that shall come to pass. I've said many things that came to pass. God gives information to those who authorize by him to be a mouthpiece for him to warn, to encourage, to instruct about things that shall come. The Bible says it was believed that the, that the tablets of the Ten Commandments symbolizing the presence of God among the Israelites was kept in the ark. Second Samuel 6, 6-7 reads this. And when they came to make God threshing floor, Uzziah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the ox and shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzziah. And God smote him, therefore his error, and there he died by the ark. I want you to 
meditate on this particular scripture. The Bible says that you, Uzziah made an error and he died by the ark. God smote him there because he put his hand to the ark of God. This is the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forevermore. In this passage, the ark was being transported by an ox drawing cart. It began to shake. Uzziah, one of the men escorting the ark, reached out to steady it. However, according to the account, touching the ark was strictly forbidden by God's law. Uzziah's action was seen as a violation of God's commandment regarding the hand of the sacred object. God's response was swift and severe. Uzziah was struck dead by God as a punishment for his error. This incident serves as a sobering reminder of the importance of respecting the holiness of God and his commandment. We must respect the holiness of God and his commandment. God is not changed. And the demand of his holiness and keeping his commandments, his instructions. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was central to Israelites' worship. And it symbolized God's presence among his people. As such, it was treated with utmost reverence, care, and any improper handling of it was considered a serious offense to God. That is the same way God is today. Any mishandling of the sacred aspects of the holiness of God and his commandments is considered a serious offense. A serious offense. God is not changing. You can have people coming up with all of their plans, all of their doings, but God is not changing. God knows everybody's accountability. He knows everybody's responsibility. He knows everybody's action. And he does not judge without full knowledge of what a person knows and does not know. He placed his hand, Uzziah, to the ark. And the Bible says he took hold of it. For the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against him. And God smote him there for his error, and he died by the ark. This was an error. God is a holy and righteous God. And he understands everything. And many do not take the sanctity of God's holiness. The sanctity of God's holiness is not about you. It's about his holiness. And you must respect his holiness. See, this is not about agenda determining God's kingdom. You can have many people you can make God's kingdom about. But what you cannot make is to take the holiness and sanctity of God and his commandment and make a folly out of it by putting your interjection into his kingdom. See, I don't get into the things that a lot of people get into because I'm called by God. And those who are called by God, they understand the restrictions and yet the liberty and grace we have. And so because we depend upon God, certain actions and certain participation and certain things, we will not be adjoining nor partaking of. And God knows it. 
because we take the sanctity of God series. We take the holiness of God. We take the commandment of God, the instructions of God serious. We take our calling serious, no matter what someone tries to attach to the calling. The calling is not about colors. The calling is about the Holy Spirit. The calling is not about sports. The calling is about the Holy Spirit. The calling is not about cooking. The calling is about the Holy Spirit. The calling is not about medical and legal. The calling is about the Holy Spirit. The calling is not about the location. The calling is about the Holy Spirit. The calling is not about what humanity can establish and forget the calling is about what God has put in place that he changed his mind. The Ark of the Covenant was not to be touched by everybody. The Ark of the Covenant was carried on transporting from different places, but it was kept in the tabernacle. It had Aaron's rod that showed authority that God gave Aaron to be a priest. It had the Ten Commandments to show the authority of what was necessary for God's people to follow. It had the cherubims and the seraphims covering to show angels. As a reminder, he had them outside of the Garden of Eden to preclude Adam and Eve from entering back in. And the Bible says that the, they were traveling. They were transporting the Ark of the Covenant, a sacred chest containing the tablets of the Ten Commandments. The Ark was being moved on an ox drawing cart. As the cart traveled, it began to shake. Probably because of the terrain, it was difficult to carry the Ark. And the movement of the oxen, in response to the shaking, a man named Uzziah instinctively reached out to touch it. It was a natural instinct without thought of the precautions, without thought of the sanctity of the ark, without thought of the disrespect to touch the ark, that you were not authorized to touch it. You see, the ark often had poles and you could touch and carry the ark by handling the pole. However, although his actions were instinctive, they were in direct violation of God's command regarding the handling of the ark. And according to God's law, only certain Levites were permitted to touch. And even they were to do so under specific circumstances with the great reverence. The problem with humanity in the 21st century is that we fail to realize, although we are given grace and liberty, God still has specific commandments for sacredness according to his kingdom. Lack of respect and disobedience has severe consequence unto God. Improper handling without reverence and care is a serious offense to God. You can't touch 
nor obtain certain things in the kingdom unless it's authorized by God. And when it's authorized by God, you know your limitations based on the authority God gives. Because you're communing with him. You're fellowshipping with him. You're in agreement with God. And so, you can't even determine where you're going to be. God determines your location. God sets and instructs and informs and reveals where you should be at his appointed time. We don't make that choice. God has always done it from the very beginning of creation. He placed God in the garden and put Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve and put himself in the garden. He directed Moses to go to Mount Sinai. And Moses didn't go on his own. He gave Moses the command. He gave Moses the design, the architectural design for building the ark. Moses didn't just build an ark on his own. And with everything God designs and puts in place, there are instructions specifically for those who he wants to operate on his behalf. We don't make that choice. God does. He makes the choice so that we're not in direct violation of his will. that we stay within his reverence. You see, obeying God's commandment and staying in holiness and reverence unto him is sacred. Our vessels are sacred. They're not sacred by what we put on these vessels. They're sacred by what's inside these vessels. That's why these vessels are to be respected. These vessels are to be reverenced in the holiness because of what is in these vessels. The Ark of the Covenant was to be handled with sanctity. Not everybody could touch it. There were proper instructions for how to carry it, how to transport it. And then during those times, God quite often expressed and showed his anger out of disobedience. So people would know He's serious about his instructions. He's serious about his sanctity. He's serious about his will. He's serious about his grace. He's serious about his strength that will perfect you when you need his strength. His sanctity of strength, his sanctity of holiness, his sanctity of obedience, his sanctity of reverence, his sanctity of knowledge, his sanctity of wisdom, his sanctity of understanding. He's serious about his holiness. He's serious about his reverence. He's serious about not handling matters improperly. about not being in violation of improperly touching what is sacred to him. Now, let us go even deeper in this touching what is sacred to him. The same way that you could not touch 
sacred elements of the tabernacle that was designed for only those to touch. There is also about the Bible, these earthly vessels. To touch a sanctified, holy, dedicated vessel unto God is a violation towards the God that has given these vessels its sanctity. A direct violation. That's why in Corinthians, God says, that what we do to the vessels have consequences. Not just what we do, but even what someone else does to the vessel. There is grief consequences because these vessels do not belong to ourselves, but the vessel belongs to God. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. God is serious about the sanctity, the holiness, the reverence, and respect of these earthly vessels unto him because of the Holy Ghost, which is in these earthly vessels. Because he said, his kingdom is not in word, but in the power. That's the Holy Ghost, the power of his Holy Ghost. He's given direct knowledge and wisdom. What is his kingdom? What is sanctified, holy, to be honored, respected, reverent, toward his kingdom. Then he goes in further and explains in 1 Corinthians 3, know ye not, 16, that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? Our temples are sacred because they were purchased by God to place his indwelling spirit within. Just as the Ark of the Covenant was sacred to God. And no one just couldn't touch it. Because it would be a violation unto God. These vessels are sacred unto God. And everybody just can't touch these vessels. That's a violation unto God. And the Bible says if any man defile the temple of God, the vessels of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you to touch and violate and defile a holy temple consecrated unto God? God said he'll destroy who defiles it.
Then he goes on and warns and admonishes those who lack wisdom about the temple of God. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thought of the wise, that they are vain. That's why it's important to be obedient to the things of God and the ways of God. No matter what this world is trying to justify or make what you're doing about. You can't change people's perception, understanding, or lack of. Only God can bring clarification of that. You have to obey God. Let's exegete the scriptures I just read. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 12. Verse 16, Paul is addressing the Corinthians, Christians reminding them that they collectively form the temple of God and the spirit of God resides within them. This signifies the importance of unity among believers and the sanctity of their community. Verse 17, Paul is warning against defiling the temple of God, which refers to corrupting through actions contrary to God's will. Defilement is destruction, highlighting the disparity of undermining the purity and unity of these earthly vessels. We have a covenant with God that while these bodies belong to God, sacred to God, having the Holy Spirit indwell within, anyone violating these bodies there are great consequences that God will bring upon them. Just as God brought great consequences when the Ark of the Covenant was taken. The same way he brought great consequences when the Ark of the Covenant was touched and stolen. You cannot handle what belongs to God inappropriately. You cannot desecrate what belongs to God because there are great consequences and how God will bring judgment and impotate, orchestrate, implement his consequences. See, it's not the colors we put on our attire. Because the colors don't make you holy. The Holy Spirit makes you holy. We don't change who we are based on where we are. Holiness is consistent. Holiness is the power of God operating in these earthly vessels. 
Holiness is not about a location. Holiness is about a condition. You can be married and not be holy. You can be single and be holy. Marriage doesn't make you holy to a human. Holiness is what God does through his Holy Spirit. Single doesn't make you unholy. Holiness is how the single allows God's dwelling spirit to reside with them. Guide, direct, and orchestrate accordingly. Seeing doesn't make anything holy. Holiness is God's working. And what God reflects and shows is his blessings and the actions that are against his will, the consequences. We see those outward manifestation that God revealed. Holiness is not about a platform where you act. What do you? Holiness is God's work. Holiness is God's doing. So when he say be holy, he's given you a commandment to obtain what he's given you. Everything that is needful for life and godliness, he's given you. According to Peter, I've given you everything that you need for life and godliness. You have to know what he's given you. You have to know how to yield to what he's given you. You have to learn how to obey. You have to learn how to reverence, how to respect, how to honor, how to appreciate what he's given. You have to understand we're kept by the power of God through our faith unto salvation. See, this is not about gym or no gym. These are vessels. These vessels do a lot of things. There's nothing wrong with Jim. There's nothing wrong with doing activities. The unsaved does Jim. The unsaved does Activities, what makes the difference between the unsaved and the saved is who we belong to. Whose instructions do we follow? Whose sanctity we abide within? Whose holiness we embrace? Whose consecration we acknowledge? Unsaved wear clothes. Unsaved eat. Unsaved participate in all types of things. 
unsaved takes care of their spouse and their household and their kids. Unsaved work. Unsaved purchase. Unsaved do a lot of things. But what they don't do is respect the holiness of God and his commandment. That makes a difference between those who profess salvation and those who don't. Your relationship with who owns you. If we've been purchased by God, if we've been owned by God, he owns us because he purchased us. As he said, know ye not that your vessel belongs to him because he purchased it to put the spirit in your vessels. And that determines the difference of your vessel. Who owns it? Who owns it? There are different parameters based on ownership. You can't just do what you want to do to your vessel. It don't belong to you. It belongs to God. And if it belongs to God, then we are to have our vessel used to glorify him. We glorify the owner. We glorify the one who redeemed these earthly vessels. The Bible says it was bought with a price. We are reminded we have been purchased with a price. Now this is interesting because when you think about what God is saying that he bought these vessels with a price. We live in periods in which humanity buys vessels. Anything that is sanctity, sacred to God, that is done under God's parameters, his ways, his wisdom, his knowledge, you will find conformity of the world duplicating the things of God's sacredness, but it won't have the holiness. Jesus purchased these bodies. They rightfully belong to him. We are his inheritance. As his purchase, those who receive them have been filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us into holiness, godliness. It's not our workings, it's the workings of the Holy Spirit that transforms our mind, that keeps us from conformity of this world. That's why we should not be thinking worldly ways because the Holy Spirit ways are not worldly ways. But yet, we have worldliness, even in the Bible with those who were not sanctified, were not consecrated, was not holy unto God. There were those even now today, we have human trafficking. We have people who sell their bodies. Workers of iniquity. We have those who take the body, their temple, that is not purchased by God, that is not acknowledged that it belongs to God and they use it for purposes that are not honoring and respecting God. And God knows that. He knows all things. We can fool human but we cannot fool God.
because God determines all things and we don't. And anyone in God's kingdom who makes it about them as the focal point consistently their will, their wants is not in the alignment with God's will. And so you see, you have a variety of doings. That's why it's important to trust God. God says when you're going through trials and tribulations, trust him. Because if you try to work it out on your own way, you're going to find yourself working it out to the flesh. And the flesh will never honor nor please God. Because you will be doing it the ways of the world. Conformity. You will think like the world. You will act like the world. And there will be no sufficiency of God's grace, no strength of God, because you'll be weakened by the world, the world's conformity. The world's conformity. And so we see that God says you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God. He said the body and the spirit belongs to God. He says, which one are you? In the same chapter, where he says in verse 20 of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says, the body and the spirit belongs to God. Body and spirit. And chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, he says the temple belongs to God, which is holy. Then he asks, which temple are you? Do your body and spirit belongs to God? If not, which temple are you? He doesn't want you putting your faith in confidence and conformity to the ways of the world. He wants you to know who you belong to. Who you belong to will be who you will respect, honor, reverence, obey, and do the working of. See, this is not about jogging or swimming. The world jogs and swim. Christians can jog and swim. The difference is how we handle these earthly vessels. And so you don't let people try to define you because God is very consistent. He doesn't have all of these divisions. Either you a vessel belonging to him or you a vessel belonging to whoever purchased you. He purchased you but you can be bought by another purchaser. 
That's why God asked, whose vessel, whose temple are you? He knows who you are by how you reverence, adore him, obey him, and how you handle the vessel. Improper handling is a serious offense. Whether somebody improperly handled your vessel or whether you improperly handle your vessel, that's a serious offense. Handling anything that is sacred to God is a serious offense if you mishandle it. That is so profound. That is so rewarding to know that God vengeance will always exist even with mercy and grace. Improper handling of what belongs to him that is considered sacred because he rightfully purchased it. There are serious offense consequences that shall follow. Whether you do it or someone else does it. Because the vessel belongs to God. So whether somebody do something that you don't even know was done. Let's say you went to a hospital to get a physical and someone unbeknowingly you don't know what they were doing to you at the hospital. You're going there to get a check and they're mishandling your vessel. They know what they're doing. They're mishandling your vessel, putting your vessel in jeopardy. They know what they're doing. Just like they knew what they were doing when they crucified Jesus. They're mishandling the medical practice for a physical. And they put you at risk by mishandling the proper protocol for your physical. You're just there for a physical. They're doing things inappropriate unauthorized, unethical, illegal, if the truth be told. And it's affecting your temple. You know something was done, but you don't know what was done because you trusted the medical practitioner that you went to get a physical. And other people infiltrated it. And they want to run havoc over your vessel. Well, God says your vessel belongs to him. If anybody defiles it, misappropriately handle your vessel. That's a serious offense. And God will bring consequences on the worker of iniquity that did. Whether you know it or not. Whether they understood what they were doing or not. The point is they did. Whether they understood the consequences of doing such work, they knew what they would do. And they knew why. Whether they were following others' orders out of malice or they were just doing it out of their own malice. There are consequences that God will bring upon them. Doesn't have to be the law of the land. God's judgment. God's judgment. That's the blessings that we have when you belong to God. And things are done knowingly or unknowingly. God says, vengeance is mine. Because he knows everything that's done to his sacred vessel that has been dedicated, purchased, consecrated for his usage. And you don't have to worry about it. 
God is not your doors that humanity makes doors. He's omniscient, omnipresent. He doesn't operate that way. God is very serious about offenses that is done to vessels and anything he considers sacred that has been purchased for his usage. that is being defiled. He has not changed from Old Testament when you would see the ramification of disobedience unto God. Sometimes we don't always see the ramification, but it doesn't mean that it's not occurring. There are consequences with your actions when you disobey improperly handle what is considered sacred, holy unto God. When you dishonor him, when you disrespect him, there are consequences. This is the same God from the beginning of creation that we could not clearly see because it was a shadow of things to come. Jesus was fulfilling the shadow of things to come. God is not changing anything. He's remaining consistent and revealing to you. And through his revelation, he's allowing you to understand the consequences of how your vessel is being defiled. Sometimes our vessels get defiled and we're not the one defiled. You could be just going for a regular physical and it gets defiled. You could be going for medical treatment and it gets defiled. God knows everything that's done through his sacred vessel and what God does, he protects and works it out. So it will not remain that way because you didn't do it. It was done unto you. And because it was done unto you, God will make sure that the impact will not last. That the results will not be manifest. He intervenes. It can either be temporary or he could have stopped it in the first place. But he intervenes and you do not get the response of the working that was done. There's a lot of things I could say, but I don't uh, because of personal reasons. God knows, and that's who that's the only one who needs to know. God knows. And when you know God knows, you know he operates and puts in place consequences. That's why you don't have to worry about something. But through prayer and supplication, you can make your request made known to God. And you can think about God, who he is. He's just and pure and holy and righteous and true and honorable. And he has a good report. No matter what is done, he has a good report. Because if anything's done out of malice and wickedness and iniquity and unrighteousness, God is going to turn it around and he's going to make it a good report. He's going to stop. He's going to change. He's going to modify. It's not going to prevail. It will not reap the fruit of unrighteousness that it was intended to do. For those who are consecrated, dedicated unto him. That's why he asks you, which temple are you? See, when he asks you, which temple are you? He's letting you know this body of Christ is about individual temples. Everyone's going to have to stand before God. And be accountable for your work, whether it was seen or unseen by humanity, it was all seen by God. You're going to have to give an account, and God's going to judge your working, whether it was good or whether it was evil. 
He brings everything into consideration. That's why he says, consider the man. Keep my commandment. Fear me. Honor me. Be sacred unto me. Be holy unto me. Follow my instructions. Take heed to my message. Get understanding in all your getting. Get in alignment with my will because my will is not your will. And if your will is in alignment with God's will, then your will will be God's will. But many times our wills are not God's will. That's why you don't reap the fruit of the reward of a person in God's will. Abraham was in God's will. Lot was not. Lot brought contention and strife and they could no longer occupy the land together. So they had to separate. And when they separated, Lot chose the best. He was not in God's will trying to choose the best. If he was in God's will, he would have let God make that decision and not him make a decision that should have never been with Abraham in the first place. So God prevailed for Abraham. You don't have to worry about anyone trying to take something accomplish anything out of God's will because God is going to get his will. You have to make sure you're in God's will by yielding to God, by obeying God, by desiring, desiring to be in the will of God. You don't have to see it because faith is not all time sight. Faith is working towards God's will. It's obeying God's will. As God set a discipline within you, obedience. That's why the Bible says, casting down all imagination that exalts itself against the will of God and bringing it into subjection, into captivity, every thought to the obedience of God. Thoughts are not always seen, but thoughts will later overflow into actions that can be seen. So God is the discerning of your thoughts and intents of your heart. And so you don't have to worry. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to, you can be angry with sin. Uh, you have liberty in the Lord. You can enjoy yourself in the Lord because what you're doing, you're doing for God. Now, if you're doing it for people, that's something else. But if you're doing it for God, you don't have to worry about weapons that comes up against you, about people's imaginations that come up against you. You're doing it for God. God knows if you're respecting reverence God, keeping God's holiness and his instructions and not improperly handling the things of God. Even with worship, you can't improperly handle worship because that's a serious offense. We're to worship God in holiness and purity and respect and honor. If we're proclaiming the gospel, we have to do it in holiness, respect and honor. We can't handle the word of God improperly. That's a serious offense. Anything we do for God, we cannot handle it improperly. That's a serious offense. We can't handle these bodies improperly. That's a serious offense. and just put on anything and handle these bodies improperly. That's a serious offense. I just can't let anyone touch me any kind of way. That's a serious offense. That's improper handling of a sacred vessel. I can't just do anything I want to do. That's improper handling of my vessel. That's a serious offense unto God. Because my vessel belongs to God.
And he says, if anyone defile it, God shall destroy it. That's a covenant. That's a keeper of his word because it belongs to him and you can't destroy what belongs to God. You're not even supposed to disrespect, dishonor and irreverently do all kinds of matter against what belongs to God. That's why God says vengeance belongs to mine. And you have to let God has his vengeance. That's what keeps the believer. That's how he's able to keep you. He's able to keep it because you know who belong, who you belong to. The one who owned you is able to keep you. Because he knows all truth, no matter what truth is being personified. It's true. He knows the truth. He knows all things. He knows all intentions, whether it was honorable or dishonorable. He knows everything, whether it was premeditated or accidentally. This person accidentally, out of instinct, touched the sacred Ark of the Covenant. But yet there were consequences because you're not supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. That's sacred. You cannot improperly handle what is sacred. There are consequences. And it's your job to know the consequences for disobedience unto God. It is your responsibility to, to seek God to learn the consequences. That's a part of being united with Christ. To understand what pleases him, what dishonors him, what displeases him. You understand that's your responsibility to seek and to find out and to know. And sometimes we don't take accountability for our responsibility. We don't ask. We don't seek. We don't want to know. We let others determine. But we don't ask God. You see, there's joy in the Holy Ghost. There's power in the Holy Ghost. There's a fulfillment in the Holy Ghost. There's an assurance in the Holy Ghost. There's an ownership in the Holy Ghost. There's sacredness in the Holy Ghost. There's a keeper of his word in the Holy Ghost. There's a revealer in the Holy Ghost. And there's faith in the Holy Ghost. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also were we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, and not receive the things of God because the spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned but he that is spiritual judges all things yet him himself is judge of no man for who have known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of Christ that's why it's important to have the mind of Christ if you don't have the mind of Christ, then you'll take things and cannot discern them because you're trying to understand it with a cardinal mind. Now let's get ready to bring this to closure. Improper handling has consequences. Improper handling 
and proper handling of what is sacred to God. To the Lord has consequences. Improper handling of what is sacred to the Lord has consequences. See, you are blessed not just by sight. You are blessed because God blesses and you can never change what God blesses. Because he deposits within. You can never take a blessed person and make it unblessed. That's impossible. Because of God's power. Because the blessing would never be about humanity. It's all about God. He knows humanity. They'll try to control it. Improper handling of what is sacred to the Lord has consequences. Now, God is just honorable in all his ways. And many times we don't think about how God handled those who improperly handled what was sacred to him. This is the same God. You, can, you must have the mind of Christ. If not, you'll be operating in the natural and you will receive not the things of the spirit of God. So you will take what is spiritual and make it in your mind and imagination, carnality. You will lack understanding, which means you'll have no wisdom to the things that God is talking about. That's the beauty of who God is. See, a wise person understands they need the mercy and grace of God. That God's grace is sufficient. Because he said, my grace is sufficient for you. When you feel insufficient, when you feel weakened by the ways of this world, God says, my grace is sufficient in you. Because his grace is a vehicle that keeps you in the understanding of the sacredness, reverence, Holiness of the things of God. Respect, honor for the things of God. Respect and honor for the things of God. Respect and honor for the things of God. You can disagree in respect. You can disagree. You don't have to accept everything. When the spirit tells you no. His grace is sufficient. There's a reason he's saying his grace is expense it is, is sufficient. Grace. Is necessary in the Christian's life. Grace is necessary in the believer's life and it's sufficient. You 
you're never alone. His grace is sufficient. You see, my grace is sufficient for thee. God's grace, his favor and strength is all that you need during times of trials and tribulation. God's favor and strength. That's all you need. God's favor and strength. That's all you need. God's favor and strength. God's favor and strength. Nobody can stand up against God's favor and strength. That's all you need. Some trust in horses and some trust in cherries. Some trust in people. Some trust in locations. Some trust in material wealth. Some trust in humanity's promises. But if God's grace is sufficient, his favor and strength that's all you need. And he'll do the rest. But you have to trust in his favor and strength. And let us get ready to pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, thank you. Hmm. Thank you for reminding favor and strength is what is needed. favor and strength of God to keep us from the conformity of this world that weakens the inner person when it's not properly fed by the spirit. When it's not properly nourished by the spirit when it has no understanding, knowledge, wisdom to know how to apply the things of God. Favor is knowing how to apply. Favor is knowing how to reverence God, honor God, glorify God, not improperly handle the sacred things of God. That's wisdom. And wisdom is favor and strength. His grace operating, giving us resources from heaven with understanding that's applicable to our lives and others as he gives utterance to proclaim, manifest, make known. And so, Father, we thank you for all that you've done and you continue to do that is our desire to see you manifesting your favor and strength through your power in all circumstances to bring everything into obedience to your will. We thank you for being the glorious one, the honorable one. Even when trials and tribulations came, you kept the joy that's not of this world, but it's our strength because it's in you. A reminder that you know everything that's done, seen and unseen, whether it was done for honorable or dishonor, whether it was done intentionally or accidentally, whether it was done for malice or not. You know all things. Premeditated. You know all things. But there are consequences with all actions because you know all things. He improperly touched the ark. Instinctively just touched it. 
but there was no authorization for it to be touched by him. And there were consequences. You're the same God revealing consequences, whether we fully understand the consequences or not. It's our responsibility to know, to seek you, and you will reveal and make known because of your Holy Spirit that you give for those according to your purpose. So there will be no excuse. And so we honor you, God. We worship you and we thank you for your more excellent ways. Of the unification with you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We can't improperly handle anything that is sacred to God. There are consequences for improperly handling the sacred things of God. There are consequences. There are consequences for improperly handling the sacred things of God. That alone should resonate into rejoicing and knowing that you are a sacred, holy vessel temple that has been purchased by God, consecrated by God, dedicated by God. That, that alone. should allow you to embrace the favor and strength that God places upon the sacredness of God. Amen, amen, amen. He's holy and righteous. And I just can't thank him enough. I just can't thank God enough. Just can't thank God enough. Just can't thank God enough. Just can't thank him enough. Just can't thank him enough.